Hello and welcome to a new Oxygen XML webinar. My name is George Bina uh, and I invited uh, my colleague Stephen uh, to talk about uh, his experience as a technical writer with Data and Oxygen. We already had uh, two other webinars this year. You can find them uh, on our website, recorded, and uh, we'll have also a recording available for today's webinar. Before we start, uh, here it is some useful information. Uh, as I mentioned, this webinar will also be recorded and it will be made available uh, from our website on the event page, on the webinar page, as well as on our YouTube channel, which is uh, Oxygen XML. You will receive also an email with a link to the recording afterwards. Please know that you can ask questions at any time uh, during the webinar. Uh, both me and my colleague Bogdan will also are available to answer your question as we go while Stephen presents. And you can use also Twitter uh, and mark your questions with uh, the Oxygen XML hashtag or address them to the Oxygen XML account. We'll monitor that as well. Uh, without uh, further ado, let me uh, switch control to Steven so he can start his uh, presentation. Hello everyone, thanks George. My name is Steven Higgs and George asked me to present a webinar on my perspective as a technical writer in using DITA and oxygen. Uh, just for some background, background about myself, I, as you can see I have a lot of experience in writing documentation, but only a few years of experience with structured authoring. And currently I'm a technical writer for Seekersoft, the makers of oxygen. So for our agenda in this webinar, First, I want to briefly discuss my experience with learning DITA after coming from a background of unstructured writing, and I'll give you my impressions of DITA now that I've been using it for a few years. Uh, next, uh, we'll explore the full documentation workflow for our company, and hopefully this will uh, perhaps give you some ideas and an insight. Uh, and then I want to present various features that I use in Oxygen, uh, basically that uh, maximize the benefit of, of DITA. And I, I hope to uh, give you some tips and, and useful ideas. So first of all, first of all uh, my experience with learning DITA. Uh, hopefully this will be helpful for those of you who are thinking about switching to DITA or perhaps just getting started with DITA. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I have a lot of experience with writing, but uh, not so much with structured writing. Throughout my career, I was responsible for various styles of writing and at least some form of documentation in every job that I had. I even minored in writing in college. But up until a few years ago, it was uh, all in unstructured writing applications, such as Microsoft Office products, Adobe products, Windows tools, Dreamweaver, numerous other tools. And I remember many frustrating hours spent doing things such as typing the same things over and over again, wishing I had a handful of shortcuts for a certain combination of words that I reused over and over again or creating similar content over and over again, then searching for all instances to fix the same content, or fixing pasted content that somehow lost its formatting, or the whole process of publishing changes to a website, viewing the result, finding that it wasn't what I expected, going back to Dreamweaver to fix it, repeat over and over. I could go on and on. But fortunately, uh, those days are behind me. <laughs> now I've become accustomed to structured writing. So my first experiences with structured writing or XML 
about two and a half years ago, I started working for Synchrosoft. And of course, it was an advantage for them to have a technical writer with a lot of experience and skill in writing. But at the time, I wasn't familiar with XML or DITA. And fortunately for me, I think it's easier to teach someone a new technology than it is to teach someone how to write. So my first experience was uh, with our website project. Uh, just a, as a basic background, our website project is a customized XML framework designed by our webmaster. And I think my first task was to start proofreading various parts of, of our website. And so this was my first experience with XML and structured authoring. And so I started to get familiar with XML and structure and getting familiar with oxygen all at the same time. And then my next task was to start getting familiar with DITA. And all of our user manuals are documented in DITA. And I remember it took some time to start getting used to the different tags and elements, but I also quickly came to the conclusion that I liked the DITA tag structure better. It just seemed to make more sense to me from a writer's perspective. I also had to get used to the DITA Maps Manager, but again, uh, I quickly learned that I liked it a lot better. It was uh, more intuitive and a table of content structure, a hierarchical structure, and it just made more sense to me than using the, the project view. Uh, in the beginning, I used some features that I no longer use or need. For example, I remember in the beginning, I uh, often used full tags mode. This uh, helped me learn the data structure and elements and what type of elements or attributes can be inserted in various locations. I also used the outline view quite often to help learn the structure. I even used the model view at times so that I could understand what elements could be inserted. Uh, now that I am familiar with the structure, I never use any of these features, but uh, they were very useful in the beginning to help me learn the data structure. I also had to learn to break old habits that I'd learned from unstructured writing days. Um, I had to get used to the enter key being used for the content completion assistant rather than inserting a new line. Uh, but once I did get used to that, I loved it because uh, I was always the type of writer that didn't want to take my hands off the keyboard. And th of course, the content completion assistant allows you to pretty much document most things without taking your hands off the keyboard. But over, the, over time, I adapted to that as well. So now I use a combination of the content completion assistant, I used some architectural menu actions, toolbar actions, some various views, and I'm going to show you some of those things. I use shortcuts. Basically, I use whatever means is most efficient and effective for whatever I need to do at that particular moment. And that's just something that I adapted my writing style to uh, the tool I was using, Oxygen, and the uh, the standard that I was using, and that uh, obviously is DITA. So looking back, uh, I'd have to say that most of it was pretty easy to learn. Once I learned how to use Oxygen and XML, DITA was actually a, ple a pleasure to learn, even though I came from an unstructured writing background. And if I recall correctly, I think I was com comfortable documenting in DITA on my own with just a little help from colleagues within two or three months, so it was not uh, daunting at all. Now I want to give you my impressions of using DITA after, now that I've used it for two, two and a half years. Uh, these are some of the advantages that I see. If I had to choose one single big, biggest advantage, it would be this first one. That would be the ability to reuse or repurpose content quickly and easily, and it reduces mistakes and saves a lot of time. 
It's also very easy to manage uh, your structure since it's, especially the data map manager being a table content type of structure. It's a, a very good standard for web-oriented content. Uh, the modular approach helps organizing large projects. Uh, it has fewer tags and at least to me they're much easier to understand than other standards. Uh, conditional profiling and controlling values also helps reduce mistakes and save time and I'll show you uh, some of the things that, that we do with those concepts. It allows you to d deliver multiple formats and customize the output in numerous ways. And this is my list of the ultimate benefits of DITA after using it for a couple years. Uh, it helps increase the quality of my content. I can, again, as I said, I can easily reuse and repurpose content. It makes the content creation process far more efficient and intuitive than any other writing standard that I've used. And the tag structure makes more sense to me than other XML standards such as DocBook or TEI. So let's move on to the next part. Uh, again, as I said, I want to explore the documentation workflow flow for our company. And I'll show it I'll show you our workflow in its entirety and perhaps this will provide a real life example of a software company using DITA in a documentation lifecycle. Uh, just to so show you a visual representation, this slide shows a typical documentation lifecycle. I'll try to ad adapt how we do things to this type of lifecycle. So the first part, understanding requirements, uh, that would be determining the requirements for the project, uh, the audience, the tools that will be used. Then the def design phase would be the phase where you collect all the content. The develop phase would be the content creation phase. The review phase would be proofreading and collaborating with the subject matter experts. Uh, finalized would be revising and then committing the changes to a repository and finally publishing, generating the ultimate output. And then of course it would start all over again for the next version of the software. So the first part, uh, documentation requirements. For our requirements we have our oxygen editing suite of products, author, developer, editor, and for each of those, we have two distributions, the standalone application and also an Eclipse plugin. So just for those three products, we need six deliverables, six variants of the user manual. And then these are also for multiple platforms, Windows, Mac, and Linux, but we chose not to profile our user manual for those. We, we have some topics that are specifically for Windows or Mac or Linux and we have notes scattered throughout the, the user manual that for something that is specifically different for one of those platforms. But for the most part, uh, our deliverables are the same for all three platforms. So th these, these six deliverables require one user manual project. project. Then we have some new products. Uh, first off, Oxygen XML Web Author. And this probably at some point will become its own user manual project, but for now it's kind of integrated into our, our big user manual product as a separate chapter. And then we have a new product coming out. It hasn't been released yet. It's called Oxygen Content Fusion. And I'll briefly show that to you at the very end, uh, but that requires one entire documentation project in its own. And then of course we have our website. That's another separate project and several other documentation tasks. So these are our requirements. Every time we release a new, bit, a new version, these document, these requirements 
reset. So ultimately for the output, we need eight versions of online web help, eight versions of online PDF. And by the way, I've starred these just to let you know that these are the forms of output that I always keep in mind when I'm documenting because in our minds these are the most important and most used versions of the of the output. Then we have three versions of offline Windows compiled help, three versions of offline Eclipse help, three versions of offline Java help. And then of course we have the website and uh, there's there's another feature in Oxygen that we need to to keep in mind when we're documenting it's uh, our dynamic help. Uh, every dialog box in Oxygen has this little icon at the bottom, this question mark, and if I click on that, it will take you to the specific topic in the in the documentation that describes that dialog box. So when I'm documenting, I need to uh, keep that in mind and and collaborate with the developers to give them the topic ID so that they can make sure that it points to the, the correct topic. And we also have a view called the dynamic help view that uh, no matter where you are in oxygen, whatever the focus is, it changes that view to uh, show you the topic that, that most relates to that focus. So those are just things that I have to keep in mind when, when I document. Uh, for our versioning repository system, we use GitHub via source tree. And we also, for our website, we use our own SVN client. For project management, we use Jira. It's a project and issue tracking software. Uh, I'll briefly show you that in a minute. And then for documentation tools, I use both uh, Auction XML editor and author. So the next phase, the design phase. As I said, we, we use Jira for project and issue tracking. So when we're uh, collecting the content that we need for our documentation, most of it comes from that project system. Uh, let me show you. And there's various views in Jira, but it's it's basic. It basically allows us to manage the product projects, and the developers and management determines what new features, what fixes need to be included in each version, uh, improvements, so on and so forth. So for everything that is done on the developer side and the documentation side, there are our tasks added in here. And, and uh, ultimately, from the documentation standpoint, we every Jira task has lots of comments and, and uh, details. There's uh, various tabs from the work log, comments, so on and so forth. For the documentation team, we uh, we have a tab that that has comments from the developers uh, that basically give us some information of what they think need to be documented. And then, of course, we also, uh, from time to time, collect information from emails and we have uh, the advantage of working face-to-face -face with our developers because all of our team works in the same building. Um, for the collection sources, uh, just to give you an idea of where all the project information comes from, what determines uh, what new features and improvements are added in each version. Uh, our management and developers uh, look at technical support tickets that come in. They look at feedback that they get from clients, uh, internal feedback from either us or uh, the quality assurance department. And then, of course, management and developers do a lot of planning, to, like I said, to determine what type of new features and improvements go into each version. 
the next phase is the development or the creation phase and the solutions that we use oxygen XML editor and author uh, obviously we use DITA for the user manuals we have reusable components we use conditional profiling variables and controlled values I'll show you some of those things um, we manage uh, the data map as a table of contents type of structure I'll show you that we uh, use index terms to create an index in the output and we have glossary terms also for the output for the website as I mentioned we use a customized XML framework for screenshots icons images just use a basic image editing tool and then we have some error prevention and correction features let me explain that in more detail so of course in the scope of the entire data map we uh, validate and check for completeness um, we have a style guide this is the style guide I, I created it uh, at some point after I started working here um, we actually have a button that's a customized action that takes us to the style guide basically it uh, defines our documentation rules as various grammar rules style rules basically it's uh, designed to to help maintain consistency in our documentation and we we take this a step further so some a lot of the rules that are in our style guide we implement in schematron rules so that it imposes these guidelines or rules in the documentation and gives uh, the authors hints and we also use quick fixes to help the authors with these rules and I'll show you some of those things as well and then of course we use spell checking autocorrect and other grammar tools the next two phases in in our life cycle our documentation workflow we we kind of uh, it, they're kind of inter interlinked and uh, combined so there's the reviewing phase and the finalizing phase uh, proofreading obviously is very important in any documentation um, I proofread everything that I document but of course our our brains are programmed so that when we're proofreading our own documentation we know what we meant to write and so sometimes our brains will skip over errors uh, not realizing that it was a, uh, a mistake so it's it's always beneficial to have multiple sets of eyes proofreading so in our workflow after I document something uh, back in the the ticket tracking software I issue a comment uh, indicating what I did for the documentation process I commit on the repository and then the, the developers review the documentation that's the first set of eyes and then our quality assurance department also reviews documentation and of course we have various tools for collaboration um, every developer is different some of them uh, like to use oxygen and turn change tracking on or add comments commit and then I see their changes there some of them add comments in the the project and issue tracking software or they send emails as I said uh, we have the advantage of face-to-face -face collaboration and then we have some other collaboration tools but ultimately it's uh, to achieve this process so we proofread we collaborate we revise if uh, if we need further proofreading further collaboration revision it just it's a circular pattern until we get to the the point where we're happy with it the developers are happy with it and it can proceed to the publishing phase for our publishing phase for our user manuals we use an automated publishing process for the online versions it's generated at the time of each release and as needed and is delivered online in web help and PDF formats 
the online versions are also generated nightly for testing and review purposes. The offline versions are generated only at the time of release and delivered with installation kits. And then we use other automation such as validation tests, automated validation tests, and we use Jenkins for continuous integration. Uh, these are just tools that that help us as writers uh, to make sure that we aren't introducing validation errors and and uh, other such things. And then for the website, the webmaster generates the output as needed. So that's basically our workflow. And then, like I said, at that point, we start all over because we're always uh, documenting and always working on the next release. So for the, the remainder of, of the webinar, I want to show you some, some of the various features in Auction and that I use that make my job easier and more effective. And maybe it'll provide some ideas to help you get the most out of Oxygen and Dita. And I'm also going to show you some brand new features, some of which haven't even been released yet. Uh, maybe it'll get you excited about the, the upcoming release of Oxygen, some of the, the nice new features that we have. So to uh, give you an idea of how we have organized our user guide, as I said, we have one major uh, user manual project. We organized it in various folders. For example, all of our images are in one folder. All of our topics are in one folder. All of our maps are in one folder. And uh, for each chapter in our user manual, we have a submap. And in some of these chapters, there are submaps within those submaps. But the ultimate goal is in the output. By the way, this is our new web help responsive system. It's uh, a more flexible and intuitive web help version, uh, more modern and, and uh, mobile friendly. Each of these tiles represent a chapter and represent a chapter in our data map. Now as for the data maps manager, um, of course when I'm editing specific topics, I can uh, turn to the, the specific sub-map and then I have access to a variety of editing actions that I need. But I also perform some tasks in the scope of the main data map. Um, basically, I, I perform these tasks anytime it's something that, uh, that needs to be performed on the entire structure of, of my user guide project. For example, I uh, mentioned validation. These are the type of things that we want to uh, validate on a regular basis. Validate all topics according to the DITA standards, check for broken links, key references, content references, check for missing images, uh, broken links to websites, unreferenced resources. Those are just a few of the things that we check for. And I perform this data map validation check uh, quite often. Another thing that I use the, the main data map for is, is finding specific content. Of course, I can use the open find resource view to find specific topics. If I know the topic name, I can use the in-file path to find a specific topic, or I can search for specific phrases. But one of the very useful features that I found in the scope of the entire data map is the find, replace, and files action. Uh, if my focus is my main data map, 
I, and I invoke this action. Here's a very specific example of something I searched for recently. I wanted to find all instances of Data Maps Manager found in the entire user guide. And this XPath expression, this is uh, something that uh, it took me some time to learn and understand, but basically this is saying find all instances of this and it's not in one of these elements. The nice thing about this is then I can narrow it down. If I was to search for it without restricting it to uh, the search in the XPath expression, I would find hundreds and hundreds of instances. But in this case, I'm just going to find four. So then I can search for those specific or go to those specific topics and find out why I don't have that specific term in one of the elements that I expected. And uh, we also have some refactoring operations that you can do on the entire scope of the the DDMAP project. I'll actually show you some of these later on. Another useful feature that that I use the the main data map for, I always keep this main data map open, is because we have uh, multiple topics throughout our user guide that is that are referenced in multiple places. Uh, let me find an example here. So for example, this, this topic is referenced four times in our entire data map structure. And you see in the top right corner, it shows you how many times it's referenced. You can use these navigation arrows to take you to each instance. This is a fairly new feature that's, that's very helpful. And of course, uh, as I said, we use the submaps to do a lot of the editing. We can move topics around. I use the Edit Properties dialog box quite often, especially for profiling. And I'll show you more specifics on uh, how we use profiling in our project. Um, let's talk about creating new d documents. I'm sure everyone is uh, quite familiar with the new document wizard. If I want to create a, a new topic, I can open the document wizard, search for a template. But we also have some new features that are very helpful. Uh, one example of our developers uh, taking input from users such as myself, I found myself for for quite some time when I was uh, creating new documents because our user manual is very large and we have lots of existing documents, I would uh, find myself creating a new topic with the, the new document wizard, um, but then I would find a an existing topic that had the structure that that I wanted for the the new topic and I would copy the content, paste it, and then have to go back and edit it. And I suggested that uh, it would be nice if we could do that all in one step. So we now have a new action. Let me open this data map. For example, Here's a section in our, in our documentation for CSS functions. And uh, suppose that our developers added a new function. I needed a new topic that described that. But I have an existing topic that has the exact final structure that I want. Now I can use this new action called duplicate. All I need to do is give it a new name, uh, 
and it basically duplicates the exact topic. And then all I have to do is edit the content rather than starting from scratch. You notice that there's a warning here, and uh, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. We actually have some Schematron rules that will will solve this. And then we we have another new feature that's helpful if you need to create multiple topics at once. This is this new feature. It's called Fast Create Topics, and this is basically most helpful if you have. Uh, a whole structure of topics that say you have a new section that needs to be inserted and you know the you've in advance you've planned out the topic titles you know this structure so I can go to my data map let's say I want to insert it here it's called fast create topics it opens this dialog box I can input my entire structure each indent will be a new level. So in this case, my section is going to start with a topic called Ultimate Getting Started section, then it's going to have a child topic called Conversion, and so on. I can choose whether it's going to be a child or a sibling, some other various options. When I hit Create, it basically creates my entire structure for me in the Data Maps Manager. And I can click on each topic, and you'll notice that it's inserted some structure for me. And again, you'll notice that there's a, a validation error or a, a rule, basically, and a quick fix. But I'll I'll show you those in a few minutes. So those are a few new uh, features that we have that will help you create new topics. Uh, I also want to uh, touch on document navigation. I, I told you that in the beginning I used to use the full tags mode, I used the outline line view quite often, uh, but now I mostly use the breadcrumb. It's a lifesaver. It's a very helpful feature that I'm sure most of you use. It tells me exactly where I am in the structure. So between that and the Content Completion Assistant, probably the most useful features that uh, that I use a lot. So when editing content, uh, of course I use the Content Completion Assistant a lot. And various shortcuts such as the normal bold actions. Uh, I'll use the contextual menu for various things. Probably the most helpful feature in or action in the contextual menu is the editing profile attributes action because it opens this dialog box. I can choose my profiling. I'll explain that further in a few minutes. And there's various actions that I use on the toolbar rather than, like I said, I uh, kind of adapted my style. So for example, the actions in the link drop-down menu, I, I feel it is uh, easier to, to insert cross-references, for example, from here. Of course, I could do this with the Content Completion Assistant as well, but I find it more intuitive and easier to use the toolbar. It just depends on the action. And I use the attribute view for inserting IDs. Say this section needs an ID. We also have notes throughout our documentation and uh, I can specify the type of note. This one's a tip as opposed to, say, a warning.
And there's uh, some other views that are very helpful. This data reusable components view is a new feature. I'll discuss that in a few minutes That's that I find very helpful. There's a few actions in the menus that I use for the most part. I don't, but there are a few. I'll show you some of those here in a minute. And I want to mention this styles dropdown. This basically for for new users. Of course, you can change how author mode looks by simply changing a new or choosing a new style from the top section. I also change it to a cursive style. But there's also some alternate styles down here that you can combine. And some of these, I think, will be very helpful for new DITA users. Uh, for example, the hints alternate style. This is something that was implemented after I started. So uh, thinking back, I think I could have used this in the beginning to help learn the DITA structure. It provides hints at, in all the various editing locations. Uh, there's also one called inline actions that uh, allow you to insert various actions in author mode. Anyway, I think those features will be, or some of these alternate styles will be helpful for any new users that are trying to get familiar with DITA and learning the structure. Uh, next, let's talk about schematron rules. I mentioned that we use them to prevent errors and correct errors and to impose rules. Uh, remember, I showed you this style guide that was created basically to uh, make sure our, our documentation is consistent and error-free as much as possible. So some of the things that we use Schematron rules for are to report invalid patterns for topic IDs, report web links with redundant text content, report code blocks without an output class attribute, report empty paragraphs and list items, report consecutive lists, or report tables with more cells per row than are specified in the column number. These are just a few of, of the rules that we've defined. And then we have Schematron quick fixes that help us fix some of these warnings or rules that we've imposed. For example, inserting index terms and topics, set the proper ID to a topic, remove redundant text, insert title and IDs for new sections, insert link list elements for related, related links. And I'll show you some of, of the things that we use. These uh, rules, Schematron rules and quick fixes for. So remember I created that new topic and it had a validation error. A, well, it's really a, a Schematron warning. It tells me that the topic ID must equal the file name. This is a rule we imposed. So every new topic, we want the topic ID to be the same as the file name minus the file extension. So we have this rule. I, I duplicated this uh, topic, so of course it kept the, the same topic ID as the previous topic. And now we have a quick fix that will actually change that topic ID for me. And it's no longer a, an error. We'll use this topic to insert more things. Here's another example. You probably saw this warning earlier when I inserted a section. So my warning says that the title should have content. I can click the quick fix and you'll notice that there's another air too that the title not only should have content but the section should have an ID. So first let's add the title. I can click it again to add an ID to 
either this current section or all sections within that topic. And one more rule is that it doesn't want an empty element. So, and it's valid now. Another example when I enter a fig element, this is a, a figure. Rule says that it should have a title. So I can add a title. And it also says that it should be wrapped in a paragraph. Now this is an example of a rule that is not only, and a quick fix, that is not only to help the writer, of course it saves me a lot of time because I can uh, quickly insert titles and wrap elements without doing it manually, uh, but it's also for the, the final output. We found that when our fig figure elements uh, were not wrapped in their own paragraphs that it didn't have enough padding before or after certain elements. So we decided to impose a rule that any time a figure element is added that it is required to be wrapped in a paragraph. Uh, one more example that uh, I'll show you. Let's say I insert a, a related link. This is another example of this rule is designed both for the output and to help the author. So it's saying that it should be in a link list and the quick fix does everything for you. The reason why we did this is because the, uh, the default engine, uh, anytime really links were added in some of the output, if it was a task, it would group it into related tasks category. If it was a topic, it would be related information. If it was a concept, it would be related concepts. We decided that in our output, we want all related links to fall under one category, and that's related information. And so it needed a structure that looked like this. The related link would be inside a link list with a title, the link, and rather than inserting all those elements myself, we impose this rule in quick fix so it does everything for me. So it not only imposes the rule that's going to improve our output, but it also uh, makes it more efficient for me and the other writers. Next, uh, I want to describe how we use, how we reuse content. So let me go back to the, all of our, every one of our chapters has its own separate reusable component. And that's where we store all of our reused content. So for example, this is our reusable co component for our data chapter. And it seems like a jumbled mess, but all of this comes together and is used. Now, every company and documentation team uh, does their reusables different. Some sometimes they'll just use one component, uh, but this this seems to be the best approach for us. And I'll also show you how to use uh, the various tools for inserting the reuse components. Uh, we always use con key refs rather than than con refs. Uh, as I said, we we are required to have multiple outputs, so using con key refs is uh, vital for that. We have various keys defined. I'll talk more about how we use the product, but you'll notice that uh, we have keys defined for versions and even for external links all sorts of things. So for inserting reused content, here's, a, here's an example of a topic that has a lot of, of uh, references to reused content. 
So in this section, uh, we have a bunch of topics for form controls that are supported in Oxygen. And each of these form controls have various properties. A lot of these properties are the same in each of these form control topics. So of course we can just reuse the entire property over and over again. This is uh, obviously most helpful if, for example, this, uh, this property is changed in the next version. All I have to do is go to the, the reusable component, edit it at one time, and then in every one of those uh, form control topics, it'll be changed there. And uh, I also use a new feature called the Data Reusable Components View. Um, just to uh, let you know, in the, in the future, this will have uh, more features, but for now, basically, it uh, gathers all the keys that you've defined in your data map. I showed you that we have various keys defined, as well as the reusable components, any topics that are defined as a key. And you can insert links to to, uh, to the keys or as variables. Uh, let me give you a, a real life example of what I use this for. So throughout our documentation, we have uh, various glossary terms. And for our glossary terms, actually, let me show you. In our glossary term, data map, every glossary term is a separate topic, it has a key, and every key has a naming convention that starts with gloss entry, underscore, and then the name of the glossary term. So one, one very useful way that you can use this reusable components view is, so I have all my glossary terms with a naming convention, I can use the filter, and now I see all of my glossary terms. As I'm editing, let's suppose that I enter one of the glossary terms. All I have to do is find it, double click, and it instantly uh, inserts a link to that glossary term. Very helpful. Uh, a few minutes ago, I mentioned that there are a few actions in the menus that I use. Let me show you one uh, very specific helpful action that uh, you may not be aware of. Suppose that in this particular form control, the developer tells me that for, for this visible property, that they decided to change the default value to false. Well, th therefore, this this uh, reusable content won't work for this particular topic. So what I can do is uh, focus my cursor anywhere inside the reusable, inside the data menu, there's an action called replace reference with content. It converts that reusable content to normal content and then I can go in and edit it. And uh, one more thing that I want to show you that is helpful in terms of uh, reusables. I can use an action in the contextual menu. I've selected my element that is reused. If I, I can search for all references in the entire user guide. And it'll search and show me all instances that that content is reused. In this case, it's Actually, let me select the correct elements that you can see. Uh, 
Ah, maybe it's the pH. See, so I have two topics where that particular content is used. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, how we use profiling and conditional content. Let me open this. This has a lot of, you'll notice, and let me close these, give me a bigger window. You'll notice that uh, we have our product defined. I, we talked about how we have eight different variants of the output, eight different products. This particular topic is about the project view. In, stand, in the standalone application, it's called the project view, but in Eclipse, it's actually called the navigator view. So you notice that we have it profiled differently. You can, we can also profile entire topics. I like to also turn on colors and then I can, uh, it really, it stands out every section piece of content that's profiled differently. And you can see that if I choose one of my condition sets, author is one of my products, it'll gray out the content both in the data maps manager and the author mode so now I can see only what is going to be shown in the output for that variant, the author product. This is very helpful, especially since we're managing eight different prod, uh, products in one project. We also use some, some more advanced uh, concepts. Uh, we've defined each of our products as keys and we control their values and we also use them as variables. Let me show you how that works. So we use controlled values, here's our products and basically this is imposing the values so that we can only use one of these values whenever we use this product attribute. This makes sure that we are never introducing a, a value that doesn't exist. Of course, our output is only geared towards the eight products that we have, and so we don't want to use other values. And then we use them for as variables to expand differently for each of the variants. So, for example, let me go back to, well, let me, uh, let me enter our product. So we have it defined as a code template in our framework. So if I find my product, it will insert it as, just to show you real quick how it inserts as a variable, inserts it in a pH element, has uh, a key ref to the product that I have defined as a key. And you see that it is expanded as Oxygen XML Editor. But if I want to see what, how it's going to expand for the author variant, I can switch to that condition set and you'll see that it's now expanded as XML Author instead of Editor. So that's how we use, we use profiling very heavily throughout the the project so that we only have to have one user manual for all products and we have certain sections and topics that uh, are profiled for certain variants, we have content within topics that are profiled for certain variants and then we use uh, variables so that it expands properly for each variant and we control the values to make sure that uh, we're using the proper values and everything makes it to the output properly.
I just want to show you a few more new features that, uh, that will be introduced in the upcoming version in a few weeks. Um, I want to go back to this chapter. And let's open this submap. Now notice that this topic, well, it's a concept. I know that from this icon. And it's it doesn't seem to fit. I don't know why it's it was uh, created as a concept. It was a, it was an error on my part. I shouldn't have created it as a concept. It should have been a topic. So now we have a new action, a refactoring action, as I mentioned earlier, in the refactoring sub menu. That will that will allow me to convert this concept to a topic and you notice you can convert from various types. You can convert to a concept or a reference or a task or to troubleshooting. This will be helpful in the near future because we have a, a commons problem section in our user guide that basically, uh, in, uh, well it uh, presents common problems that users uh, report and it has the problem and the solution. and. Uh, this troubleshooting uh, topic type is something that was introduced in DITA 1.3 and I think it will be a very helpful uh, format for that chapter. So I'll be converting a lot of topics to troubleshooting. In this case, I'm just going to convert this concept to a topic. You know, so I have a, a preview button that basically will just show me what is happening. To, make sure that it's it's not going to do something unexpected. When I hit finish, you notice it's now a topic. If I hit refresh in the data map, oh, I don't want to save it. But if, if I was to save it and hit refresh, then it'll change this icon as well. But basically what this action does is behind the scenes oxygen will uh, remap the elements within that topic to match the structure of the topic type that you're changing it to. Um, sometimes when you're changing from a uh, less restrictive type to a more restrictive type, you'll have some errors introduced. For example, if you're going from a topic to a task sometime, let's say you have more than one section in that topic, it's going to introduce an error because in a, in a task type of topic you can't have multiple sections. So sometimes there'll be some manual adjustments that need to be made afterwards, but it's a, a very useful feature for converting topic types very quickly. Uh, another new feature that will be introduced is the concept of master file support in in DITA. I can master file support and here let me I can add my main map to the master files folder and the reason why this is useful is now anytime I want to rename or move a resource, whether it be a data resource or even an image or some other non-data type of resource, uh, it will allow you to choose to automatically update all the references to that resource. Let me show you. This is a folder that we don't use, so it's not going to cause any problems. Let's, so I can move, let's say I, I move these resources to a different folder. Uh, 
actually it's not going to work here now that I think about it because I don't have any references in this folder. But uh, if it was, I don't want to do it in because I don't want to have to go back and then do everything I did. But uh, if it if it was in a folder that had references, real references, it would have uh, displayed another dialog box and allowed me to choose to update all the references. Again, it has a preview window that you just saw for the other action that I just showed you and it'll update all references. This will save a lot of time. It, I used it recently because uh, we used to have, just like we have in our not used folder, we used to have folders for concepts, tasks, references, and we decided that we want all topics, regardless of the type, to be in one folder. So I was able to move all topics, or all, I should say all tasks in that folder to the topics folder, all concepts to this folder. And uh, if I would have done this prior to this feature being implemented, I would have had to go back to a, a validation and then update the references manually or, or use some sort of refactoring action to do it. So this is another nice new feature. The last thing I want to show you is a, a brand new tool or a brand new product, I should say, that will be introduced soon. It's called Oxygen Content Fusion. Uh, it's it's basically a, a plug-in and if it's installed, you have access to this button up here. Let me show you how it's used. It's basically a tool to allow you to collaborate with with other team members and I'll show you specifically if how we used it so it opens up this new view that wasn't here before and let me choose the topic that I uh, actually added to the project before I might have to go back to main data map. Okay, so I can just drag a topic to create a new task. Obviously, I can drag as many topics as I want. Um, the use case here would be, okay, I created this new topic. It, it's for the feature that I showed you earlier for fast create topics. It explains the dialog box how to use the feature. So I, I documented this feature, now I want to send it to the developer or the subject matter expert and have them review it to make sure that what I documented is correct and that I don't need to make any changes. I can I'll usually call it something like document, documentation review request. I'm not going to upload this at this point because I've already done that, but uh, if I was to upload it, then I would see that I have a, a task here. If I click on it, it takes me to Oxygen Content Fusion. This is, this is our new tool. You can see that my colleague and I have communicated through messages. I can share it with the, the appropriate developer in this case. Um, on their side, when they click on that link, it'll take them here. This is web author. If you, if you aren't familiar with it, this is uh, a, the lightweight uh, mobile or web version of oxygen and they can make whatever changes they need to the topic they can add messages and like I said I, I showed you that we added comments back and forth those are inserted real time if I want I can monitor the progress in, in this case, I see that he changed the files, but I also will see that in Oxygen. Shows that there's one file change. So if I get the changes, it opens a new dialog box that uh, gives me some actions to merge or manually 
merge. If you're familiar with our file comparison tool, this is based on that. Uh, here you see the various changes that the developer made. I'm going to automatically merge. And now I see all of his changes. And then I can react to it. So he doesn't like this word. Uh, that version of web author automatically has change tracking on, so I can just use the change tracking feature to either accept or reject changes. I could manually adjust it. So anyway, this is a this is a new feature that uh, a new tool, a new product that will be released shortly in a few weeks, and uh, we hope that it will uh, help a lot of our clients in their collaboration tasks. It will certainly help us in our collaboration tasks. So George, this, that was basically what I wanted to show everybody. Thanks everybody for, for listening, and uh, I want to turn the rest of the time over for any questions. Uh, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> uh, well, we actually had quite a lot of questions while you were presenting, so mm -hmm. there was quite some activity behind the scene. Um, even the first question was uh, that writing documentation is often a collaborative process where many people, different people collaborate, contribute to the same document. Uh, some of these people, such as developers or engineers, have no knowledge of the structured authoring. How do you collaborate with these uh, stakeholders? Uh, and I think that you kind of covered uh, some of uh, part of that. Uh, so uh, another thing is that uh, Stephen mentioned that our developers and our QA team uh, will review the documentation created in response for a particular issue, like you know, like, like adding uh, this action to create multiple topics. Well, what happens is that uh, after Stephen creates or changes the the, uh, the documentation, uh, automatically within the, that Jira issue, we have a link uh, that allows the developers and the QA engineers to just follow that link and open the topic in the web author, more or less in the same way as uh, the, that. Uh, the content fusion platform that you've seen earlier, so they can immediately review uh, the changes made to uh, to the documentation uh, and the you know uh, correct uh, or uh, uh, provide additional suggestions uh, in that uh, just by following that link. Uh, So, uh, someone said that uh, they didn't understand exactly uh, uh, the multiple versions of the documentation, uh, how they are uh, different. So, uh, basically, uh, we have multiple related products, it's Oxygen XML uh, developer which contains the development functionality, Oxygen XML author which contains the visual uh, editing part, and Oxygen XML developer which contains everything. And all of these uh, uh, can be uh, run either as standalone applications or as Eclipse plugins. So there is a lot of uh, common parts between them. Uh, but there are also uh, differences uh, for specific Eclipse functionality or uh, specific uh, functionality for the developer or for the author. So that's uh, that's why uh, we and initially we had different data maps reusing the same topics, uh, but then we used both keys and profiling, uh, and uh, it was uh, more difficult to switch to a specific deliverable. So then we decided to profile the key definitions and use a single map uh, 
to uh, so a map on the filter data val file defines a deliverable and in this way it's a lot easier to focus as Steven showed at some point to focus on a specific uh, deliverable. Uh, I see that you use Jira to manage the development of your content. Uh, do you see a need for a full uh, component content management system? Well, uh, in our case, uh, we actually prefer to have uh, a fully integrated process that uh, 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 integrates within the same environment the development, the documentation, the, the tests, the Q, QA, uh, quality assurance part. So basically we, uh, um, and there was another uh, question along these lines uh, that said that they, uh, we use Jira for development tasks but we haven't integrated the documentation uh, to the same extent that you, you did uh, and suggesting a webinar dedicated to how that uh, actually works. So basically we define uh, custom workflows that integrate the quality assurance, uh, the documentation, the review processes. We have also dedicated documentation workflows and so on and indeed it will be a good idea to have uh, a dedicated webinar uh, for that. Uh, what do you use uh, for automated validation testing? So uh, Stephen uh, showed you earlier the uh, uh, we have the data uh, map validation and completion uh, completeness check, which can run also Schematron uh, checks along with uh, 20, 30 different uh, data specific built-in tests. Uh, we trigger that from Oxygen. Uh, but uh, we uh, extracted that to be available also from the command line so it can be integrated in a continuous integration server like Jenkins or Travis for instance. Uh, so we have a new scripting license starting with Oxygen 18.1 that allows exactly for this kind of uh, integrating uh, the same validation as uh, in an external process. Um, there were a couple of questions uh, asking about uh, being able to reuse across documents. Uh, so now by documents some people uh, understand different deliverables and we of course we uh, do that for, for our case. Uh, but uh, it can mean also between different data maps and I, as I said initially we started with different data maps but then we decided to just use different uh, filter files for the same map uh, to, to be a little bit easier but it's the same, it, the, the, those approaches are equivalent and of course you can uh, reuse uh, different topics or set maps maybe with uh, sub maps in uh, other maps, right, so you can organize your, your reusable content to be uh, in a, in a sub-map that you can reuse across multiple data maps. Okay. So, number of variations on this. Uh, Uh, people like uh, the duplicate action <laughs> uh, and uh, also the, the possibility to change uh, the topic type. Uh, how do I control the topic types when using the fast topic uh, type creation? Uh, Stephen, maybe you can show that uh, dialogue again. Uh, basically, sure. you can choose uh, uh, you can choose the type of topic uh, that uh, you want to create. So when you, if you trigger the fast create topics, uh, you can see that uh, topic type and then you have this change uh, which basically allows you to select uh, 
a, a different template for the topic to be created and that together with the action, the factoring action that allow you to change from one topic to another, you know, you, you, you have uh, basically uh, uh, control on uh, what type of topics will be created. Yeah, so the, that dialog box, one small limitation is that you can, if, for this entire structure, it will only allow you to choose one type and it's detected from the most recently used type that you used. So if the most recently used type was a topic, like in this case, it's going to choose that type for all. But you can change it to whatever, but it's, it's going to create that same type for all of them. But then you can use those uh, refactoring actions to convert them to other types if needed. If, for example, this is a how-to and you want it to be a task, you can, it, it's only going to create kind of a, a skeleton topic, so it's going to have a very basic structure. So once you've created it, you can use that refactoring action to convert it to a task and it certainly won't introduce any errors in that case because it was uh, basically an empty document with just a title. Uh, there were there were a number of questions uh, along the lines of uh, where is the style guide available? Where are the schematron rules? Uh, you know where where people uh, can have access to that. And uh, our uh, user guide project is publicly available on GitHub. So under Oxygen XML user guide. So github.com slash oxygen xml slash user guide will get you to the user guide project where you have the style guide, the schematron rules, the entire data source for our user guide. And actually, uh, if you, maybe Stephen, you can go to the web help, you can see there that all the topics have edit links, which basically opens the oxygen web author on that, on the source of uh, each topic. So you can uh, uh, suggest uh, changes uh, to our user guide also online, basically using our, the web author. So there were questions. Uh, somebody uh, uh, saw that we are using the map at the uh, at the sibling level with the topics, but that is not the case actually. The map is uh, in the root folder for the, the other topics, but Oxygen supports uh, different levels for the maps and the topics and even allows you to publish if the uh, topics are on a remote server and the access, they are accessed through a URL. But that will not work in uh, uh, in a uh, in the standard data open toolkit, so you will need oxygen for that because we do uh, some kind of uh, additional plugin that uh, brings in resources locally and then triggers the data open processing. So, uh, but that there are uh, there is an issue for the data open toolkit, and I expect uh, data open toolkit will be updated uh, at some point to support URLs. So. Uh, for topics, so it will not matter exactly the location uh, of uh, uh, topics relative to uh, maps. Uh, another question was about use uh, of con key refs instead of con refs. Uh, and uh, uh, I see that Bogdan answered that uh, privately that we had a number of uh, issues when we uh, used to have uh, con refs and uh, moving content around. So, of course, keys provide a level of indirection and then uh, whatever change you make, it's, uh, it's a, a lot easier with keys rather than uh, with topics. Um, another question is to uh, see if, if we can show Maybe Stephen, you can show how the product is defined. So the question is, 
uh, how do you set, uh, make the key conditional basically? You know, how do we have the product uh, expand to different values uh, based, the product key expand to different values based, you know, on a different product attribute basically. So when the product is author, that expands to uh, a different value. So maybe uh -huh. if you can go into yeah, I'll show that. oxygen and show how, how that key is defined. By the way, here's the the uh, the public project that George was talking about. Yes. Okay, so for our values, remember I told you that uh, we control the values. These are the product values that can be used for that that product key. If we open the, so this is the subject scheme, and then we define each variant like this. So here's our key definitions for the product. So if it's uh, editor, it expands as Oxygen XML editor. If it's editor Eclipse, it expands as editor Eclipse plugin and so on. And then, so if I use that code template that we, oh, I have to add some content first, whatever. If I switch over to text mode, you see that it inserted, this is a code template that was defined in our framework to insert a pH element with the key ref back to our product attribute. And then, depending on the variant for uh, the output, it's going to expand accordingly. Going back here, again, I'll show you this. So if it was for developer, if I click on that, see it'll expand. So in the output, not just in author mode, but of course in the output, any time that I've used that, that product, attribute in the pH element using that code template, it's going to expand as Oxygen XML developer. Yeah, so the, 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 uh, the profiling condition sets are actually created based on DataVal filters and the, each of these filters say, you know, publish, uh, allow, uh, include the, the product equal developer or include in the output, uh, the content that is marked with product equal author, and so on. So, uh, yeah. So this is the excludes all the values, but includes the uh, product uh, equal author, right? And uh, that's why uh, the definition that is uh, written uh, in the uh, the key for the product that is marked with product equal author will be actually used uh, in the output. Uh, some interest for the content fusion platform and for the web author, uh, how uh, how they are licensed. Well, the web author uh, is generally available from our website. Uh, maybe Stephen, you can go on our website and uh, show the uh, here. Yeah, so, so on the uh, products web author, Oxygen XML web author, and then uh, there's a buy page, buy now button, and this will show uh, the available uh, options. So this is based on floating licenses, uh, and there are different uh, packages. For the uh, Oxygen Content Fusion, uh, we will have uh, a public access to that for the following six months probably uh, without uh, any cost for Oxygen users and then uh, uh, we are thinking of uh, subscription plans for authors, for the people that create the review tasks.
while the people that interact with uh, those tasks will not need, uh, will, uh, there will be no cost uh, for them. So only the, the people that create the review task uh, will have a subscription available. That's uh, our thinking, but as I said, in the, on the short term, this will be generally available uh, from within Oxygen. Okay, so I see that I see that we still have uh, about half of <laughs> uh, of uh, the people with us. So let me switch to to my screen. Just let you know that you can find uh, the oxygen events on our website. So under company events. Uh, here you can see, you know, the, the following upcoming events. We plan to have uh, a few more webinars in the future. They are not yet scheduled, but they will appear soon here. And then we have, you know, a number of uh, events where you can meet us in person. Uh, Dita Nord America in San Diego will be in April. Then we have an Oxygen Users Meetup in the uh, Washington DC area hosted by Mulberry Technologies, then we'll be at STC Summit, so the, the meetup in the Washington area is just before uh, the STC Summit, we'll be at Lavacon in uh, Ireland, at TC World in Stuttgart, we organize again, I think it's the fourth edition of the Data Open Toolkit Day uh, in Berlin, Germany, just before Data Europe, then we'll be another Lavacon and then uh, the TI members meeting. Uh, as I mentioned, maybe additional events will uh, pop up uh, here in uh, the upcoming events section. And also you can find uh, the, the past events, right, where you can follow the links if it's a webinar, uh, you can find the recordings uh, there, or if it's a, a conference like a meetup, uh, you can have, uh, you can have, find the slides and the recordings for each of the uh, sessions that uh, we presented. So earlier this year we had uh, the first Oxygen Users Meetup in Prague, uh, in, you know, just together with the, the XML Prague conference, it was a full day of sessions, uh, so you, you have all this uh, recording. So thank you for uh, staying with us, uh, you know, have more than half an hour. Ah, after, <laughs> after the initial schedule, uh, and uh, uh, we hope to see you soon uh, at one of the, so we'll have a webinar covering the 19 release, uh, soon after we will release Oxygen 19, and then we'll schedule a few other webinars, um, and maybe you can meet us in person at one of those uh, upcoming conferences. So thank you again, and hope to see you next time. Thank you, Stephen. Really, really nice uh, presentation. Thank you. And thank Bogdan you. for your support with answering questions. Goodbye.